Hi, everyone. Uh, we have here uh, Charlotte Mack. Uh, is, has, did I say it right? Sort of. <laughs> Charlotte, <laughs> okay. The German one is Charlotte Mach, and then if you go for the, the English one, it's Charlotte. And then just leave out the last name because it doesn't do English well. <laughs> no worries. Um, so Charlotte is an engineering manager at Container Solutions, and she's going to talk to us about uh, Kubernetes operators for Java developers. Um, it's going to be a shorter talk. So please be posted and uh, post any questions at our Slack and YouTube channels. So Charlotte, go for it. Awesome. Thank you, Bruno. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Charlotte. I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes operators for a bit. And if you heard about Kubernetes operators, you probably might have heard that most of them are written in Go. So the question is, why did I focus on the part of looking at Kubernetes operators in Java? Of one, I don't know any Go, and I didn't want to learn it specifically for this. But I've been using Kubernetes extensively and also different operators. And the topic of writing your own without Go kind of came up. And that's where this talk came from. Operators are a great thing to get started um, automating your applications on Kubernetes. The first time I heard about operators was when we were working on a client project and we were running into issues integrating Istio and Prometheus. And every single time I asked for help on the Prometheus configuration, we came back or people came back to me with the exactly same answer. They don't know they were using the Prometheus operator. They didn't do this manually. And why aren't we doing that? And that was a really good question because the Prometheus operator, it's one of the, the earlier and um, more popular operators, and it does quite a lot for you. You'll go a little bit more into what an operator is, how it works, and what it does in this talk, and also how to get started in Java. And while this might seem like a great endorsement for operators, it's not always the best idea. So sometimes, it's great to automate all the things, but for other reasons, there can also be use cases where you don't want to maintain another piece of software on top of your application where there might be already an operator for this out there. So there's a huge amount already written, especially for um, third-party applications that you might be using, especially anything that uses um, data storage. And this talk doesn't cover all the topics and the reasons why you don't want to do that, but there's a huge amount of YouTube videos on scaring people why to avoid writing your own operator in Java. This one is more for the other side to encourage you to try it out, figure it out, and then see that sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's not a great idea. But let's start with the basics. What exactly is a Kubernetes operator? You can see a few definitions on the slide, and that's great if you know a little bit on the internals of Kubernetes, so hearing about um, custom resources and the Kubernetes API acting as a controller and then the way of managing your applications. For me, it's fairly simple. Custom controllers for custom resources are what make up an operator. So you're trying to extend the Kubernetes API with something that knows something about your application. So basically, instead of adding a separate piece of software somewhere that takes care of your application or even having it done manually, you add something to Kubernetes itself that can take care of it. And to understand what extending the Kubernetes API actually means, we have to take a look at the components behind it and what actually happens in the Kubernetes control plane. And to be fair, this is a little bit deeper than what most people need in their day-to-day -day work, especially when they're just using Kubernetes for fun. But it is also kind of interesting to see. This is looking slightly complex, but it's already a simplified version of what Kubernetes looks like under the hood. So you have the control plane up top, which um, in my case, I only added the API server, the controller manager, and the scheduler. So you can see the three pieces here, the big ones. There's a few more pieces that I've left out because they're not relevant for our case. And also the API server itself doesn't actually keep the resources. There's a data store at CD behind it. But for our case, let's just have it as one big thing. So the API server basically takes care of managing and keeping all your resources and knowing what you have on your cluster. 
So when you run a command via kubectl, you send an API request to the server. In our case, let's say we run a kubectl command to create a deployment. So we create a deployment resource. At this point, you don't have anything real yet. This is basically just a line in a data store saying you have a deployment resource, which in itself is cool, but we all know this is not what happens. When you create a deployment, you get a few pods. The way how we get there is the API server sends out events. So once the deployment resource is created, the API server sends out events and the controller manager, specifically the deployment controller is listening. If it gets an event that a deployment has been created, it does its own thing. And what the deployment controller does is create a resource, which is called a replica set to, um, that, that's basically it from the deployment controller. So that's all it does. It listens to the events and then it creates another resource. The same thing happens again when the API server gets the replica set created. So once that resource shows up, another event is sent out and the replica set controller, a different piece is listening as well and creates a pod. This is not an actual pod as you might know it. It is the resource inside the API. So you don't actually have containers yet. The next step is then the scheduler actually decides with its algorithm where to place the pod. So which node to assign to it, assigns the node. And only then does the kubelet, the piece on the node, get the event that there has been a pod that's been scheduled. And this is the first time when we actually create a container. So your container runtime then receives the command from the, complete, from the kubelet that something has been created. So this is a lot of effort to basically create a few containers, but we all know Kubernetes does a lot more than that. So this is the way it goes. And the important piece that we want to focus on because we're looking at custom controllers and custom resources, the custom controllers are similar to the existing controllers. And if we say controller, what do we actually mean? We mean a piece of software that looks at two different things. It looks at the current state and the desired state. The desired state is what you define in your Kubernetes resources under spec. So this is what you want. And the current state is what shows up under status. What the controller does is adjust the current state to the desired state and observe to see what is actually happening. So we have a Kubernetes pattern that's called a control loop, which is basically what a controller does. It takes care of the control loop to make sure that what we want is actually what we get. This is not just triggered by kubectl commands. So you can also have recurring loops or um, other causes for this. For example, um, specific regular intervals. You might see this when you delete a pod and your uh, replica set or your deployment didn't or is not aware of it, then it gets recreated. So this is what a control loop also does for you. Recreate the state that you want from the actual state that you have. And as I mentioned, by extending the API, we want to extend those controllers, so the deployment controller and the replica set controller that we've seen with our own version. So we want our own control loops that can take care of making our applications that are running conform to this control loop to make the state from the um, current state to the desired state. The thing is that the built-in ones are fairly limited, which makes sense because they're made for Kubernetes. So they are going for Kubernetes resources. So all the built-in Kubernetes resources are managed, or not all of them, but a lot of them are managed with those different controllers. And what we want to do is add application-specific knowledge. So for example, if you want to back up your database that you're, for some reason, running on Kubernetes, you need to know how to do that. And you don't want the people using it to have to know that. So the controller, you want to feed the controller that information so that controller can do it for you. And all the user has to do is, for example, change something in a different resource that I haven't mentioned yet. So we'll get back to that while still keeping the Kubernetes features, right? So the idea of not having a separate piece of software is that you still can use a Kubernetes validation and defaults and versioning, and it just stays inside Kubernetes. the different resource that I mentioned. Um, so we have the custom controllers now. 
how does a custom controller know what it wants and where it wants to go? So custom resources are Kubernetes' way of allowing you to extend its resources by basically defining your own custom resource definition. Think of it as a blueprint for your own well, custom resource. So you, on the left side, you can see the custom resource definition. That's the way of defining what you want. And on the right, right you send, can see an instance of it. It's a fairly simple one, um, literally just defining the name, but let's start from the top. So we define the different names for our resource. So when you normally run a kubectl get pods, the pod part is the resource. So in our case, if we apply this one, we can use kubectl get tomcat, and then we will get our tomcat instances. And those are used for Kubernetes as well. So as soon as you have a custom resource definition, Kubernetes is aware that this thing exists and treats it just as it would its own resources. That only applies as long as the custom resource definition exists. As soon as you delete that one, Kubernetes is no longer aware of it and doesn't care anymore. The second part is the schema, which is where you can use, for example, the validation that I mentioned. So in our case, the type as a, um, so here the var, var is a string and the version is an integer. So that one, if you do change something in your actual instance, and for example, put a string here, Kubernetes actually checks that for you if it does conform to your schema. This is a very simple version. Um, there are more complex ways of defining a schema. And the last part is basically just saying that you can have different versions as with most APIs you have um, the ability to um, basically retire older versions, only serve the newest ones. And you can also decide if you want your resources to be cluster-wide or if you want them namespaced. In our case, it makes sense to have a Tomcat, which will just be a pod, be a namespace. So that's what we have. And that is it for custom resources. So if you look at the custom controllers again, so we've seen what the controllers look like. And now the question is, how can you actually create such a custom controller? So how do you feed that controller the information that it needs? These four that I have on the slide right now are just a few examples. The operator SDK is the most uh, well-known one. That's the one that uh, does actually do Go. So I think that's the one most people are also familiar with. Kudo does, it's a Kubernetes universal declarative operator, mostly done using YAML, the Java operator SDK, without spoiling too much. I think you know which one I'm going to be talking about. And then there's also the, the RESTful APIs directly. So if you are feeling adventurous, you can go and write your own operator talking to the Kubernetes API directly. There are API client libraries for various languages from Go, Java, Python, JavaScript, .NET, Haskell, and there's a few community ones, Clojure, Lisp, Node, Perl, PHP, Rust, Ruby, Scala, and I haven't checked that list in a while, so I'm assuming they've written at least three more in the meantime. Cool. Some people, when you talk about writing an operator in Java, ask why. For me, it's more of a why not. Java has a huge community, especially if you compare it to Go. Not that Go has a small community, but if you look at GitHub repos, um, Java has about 9 million active repos versus Go having like 700,000. So it's catching up, but it's not quite there yet. Um, a lot of people know it. A lot of people use it and like it. So this is, for me, a good reason to actually use a language. Some people might also come up with... Um, Java not being ideal with memory consumption and startup time, but there have been moves into more of a cloud native lifestyle with Java with a Graal VM, Quarkus. We have a Quarkus, um, so there's a Quarkus extension as well on the Java operator SDK. So if you want a more lightweight Java application, that would work there too but I know literally next to nothing about Quarkus, so I'm not going to be showing an example there, but just to put it out there that it exists. Cool. So if you want to get started with the Java operator SDK, basically there's a few steps that you need to do first. Have a cluster somewhere. In my case, I'm using Docker for desktop. That's locally. 
um, not actually necessary for running it or for, so for testing, but it, sorry, it does make it easier for testing. It's not actually necessary up to the point where you want to deploy it. You need to create your custom resource definition and custom resource, as we've seen on the slides. So basically have an idea of what your application is supposed to know about and what it's supposed to do and what you want users to see. So the, the custom resource definition, custom resource part is basically what most people who write operators want to show to their users. So if I edit something in a custom resource, that's the extent of what a user should be doing. And everything on the operator side is the person the providing the operator giving out the information that they need from the user being put into the operator itself. Um, next step is a Maven dependency, just add it to the Java project. Um, you can check out the examples. There's that's something that I usually like to do to get started with something. You take a sample, you edit what you need, and keep going. And then once you've done that, you basically start writing your own controller. There's two important methods that you need, the create or update and the delete one. As we've talked about events before, so those are the two, there's more, but those are the two important kind of events. So you get an event if a resource is created and if a resource is deleted. So if somebody, a user creates a custom resource, then you need to decide in your controller, what does that actually need to do? And this is a very simple example of what such a controller can look like. So we do have the first piece where we register the custom resource definition and the, the class itself here. And um, the custom resource is really just a de definition of fields in the custom resource. For the first one, the create or update one, um, again, this is what is supposed to happen when an event comes in. It can be anything from for example, creating a deployment, creating a pod, but it can also be something outside of your Kubernetes cluster. So if you want to um, manage resources outside, we've seen people, for example, create uh, Jenkins instances outside of their cluster and manage them with operators. It can be something underlying to your cluster. So um, we've been working with OpenShift a lot recently and um, the, I'm sorry. <laughs> That was not intentional. And the, um, there's a lot of operators that can help you manage uh, the nodes themselves. So basically, if you want to edit the network interfaces or MTUs or something, it's easily done inside Kubernetes and with things outside. Also seen people do cloud resources. So if you want to use an operator on Kubernetes to manage an S3 bucket or put something somewhere, I mean, there's no point in limiting this, right? Because it's code. You can write whatever. Same thing for delete. You could theoretically also write whatever. But usually, it's undoing whatever happened in create or update, because this is cleaning up after yourself. So if your operator realizes that somebody deletes the custom resource, you usually want whatever the custom resource was supposed to manage gone afterwards. So after writing those two methods, you can package your operator into a Kubernetes deployment. That's as simple as packing the jar into a container and running it as a deployment on Kubernetes itself. You can see how we're getting into the, the circular version where you're then running a deployment with something that you might also want to be operating, but let's not go into this. There, there were, I think there was a talk on operating the operators at some point. Cool. Then let's try this. Wish me luck with the demo. Let's take a look first at the operator itself. So this is a very simple version of an operator. We don't only have a Tomcat in this case, but also a web app controller. So two different controllers that are also in two different files. We register both to the operator. This is to show that an operator does not mean one operator equals one controller, but you can also have multiple controllers inside the same operator. Um, not the best example, got to be honest. So you usually don't want to you know, uh, run a Tomcat as a pod and then upload your web app. But think of this as an example for what you could be doing with a custom application that actually makes sense as a demo. 
If we take a look at the Tomcat controller itself, you can see the creator of the resource method, which is basically just creating a deployment, so a Kubernetes deployment and a service. There are in other methods, but we're talking to the Kubernetes API and creating two different resources. And for the delete resource, we are just deleting those resources again. If we now go to our cluster, you can see there's pretty much nothing running at the moment except for resources locally. If I start a watch up here on what do we actually have, you can see it's complaining if I do kubectl to get Tomcat because it doesn't have a Tomcat yet because it does not have the custom resource definition yet. Let's stop that for a second and actually create the custom resource definition. So we created two now, one for the Tomcats and one for the web apps. And if we take a look at them, so you can see them here, Tomcat, if we look at it. That was not open, edit. There's a lot of stuff that you don't need to care about. And then here you can see the names that we saw earlier. And if we go up a little bit, you can see the schema here. So in our case, we're only doing um, the replicas and the version on the Tomcat and the var is on the web app. So basically it's the same as on the slides, but split up into two different controllers. Okay, so at this point, the only thing changed is we don't get an error anymore on the Tomcat. It just doesn't give us anything because we didn't create any resources yet. So what we do next is actually build and run our operator. There's a really nice um, um, Maven extension that you can, a plugin that you can use to build a Docker file out of your Java code. So that's what it's doing right now. This might take a little bit. And then you can also see a nice bug that I have with Docker. I don't know if it's on my Mac or something with the build, but if we take a look at the build, you can see it's a little older than it should be, but I guarantee it is built just now. Okay, that's what we do. And then we take a look at our operator itself. In my case, I really just put it into a deployment, used the local image that I just built and deployed on the cluster. So kubectl apply for the operator. And I have a separate namespace for it. I have a separate service account and two cluster role bindings, uh, one cluster role binding or a cluster role, which is important because your operator actually needs to talk to the Kubernetes API and have more rights than you would normally have. Um, it makes sense to kind of narrow that down to what your operator actually needs to be doing instead of doing the lazy version with cluster admin, because you don't generally want an operator if it does get compromised to be, you know, all mighty, especially if it's doing changes to your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, let's see if that one has come up happily. Yes, that looks to be running and ready. That's good. So what we can do now is take a look at our custom resource. It's very simple. It's a Tomcat. It's in Tomcat, do I actually have that namespace? I do, that's good. And then I create that custom resource, which should just be creating a Tomcat 9 with two pods. I'm watching pods on the left and you can see pods are coming up, it's great. Give them a little, in the meantime, let's check out if our service came up. Yes, we do have a service, which is just an outboard because I'm on my laptop. And go back to the pods. Yes, two test Tomcats came up. If we're going back and see if we can actually see our Tomcat. Moment of truth, yes. There's nothing on it yet, so we can see there's a uh, Tomcat 9. and. That's it for the Tomcat so far. If we do create 
the web app now. That's been applied. If we want to look at the web app, we can use it just I've done like I've done with the pods and the services as now a resource of Kubernetes. And I can actually take a look at that one as well. Also lots of stuff that we don't care about. And then here, the important parts, adding a specific var file into a specific um, part and into the Tomcat that we defined just now. We take a look. That actually did something. Oh, we have our first sample application. Cool. And um, so this is there's been a bit mix of the operation side and the actual user side. If we're looking at the user side again, so what you want your users to be doing is not edit anything with the pods, not anything with the operator, but you just want them to go to their custom resource edit that custom resource and let's say they don't like that file. So we give them a different bar file. We give it a few seconds and second moment of truth. Should be on the right screen to refresh. Yes, we changed our app. This is kind of where um, my comment from earlier comes in that this is not a perfect demo because you wouldn't actually live load a WAR file, you would just replace the pods. But this is also something we can do, right? So we can, um, for example, change the underlying Tomcat. Let's say we don't want the version nine anymore, but actually this is, might be a nice thing to see. As I mentioned, the um, validation. So let's say we don't add an integer, but instead we do a string, we save it, and then we get an error message, invalid value. So this is basically what you get from the schema. You get instant validation from Kubernetes admission controllers. Okay, let's go back to, let's say, 10. That works. And then we can actually see new pods being created. Because I created this as a deployment, it's cycling through. So it's creating a new one and then only deleting the old one. So this is going to take a few seconds before the new ones are actually up and running. And once that is happening, we can check out if we actually updated our Tomcat. And we do that by looking at a 404 page. Yes, now we do have a 10. Cool. Deletion works exactly the same way. Instead of worrying about whatever has been created, you delete your web app. And after that, you delete your Tomcat and everything goes away for you. Taking a little long, doesn't matter. Here. And now you can see they're going into terminating. That was pretty much it for the demo. Going back to the slides. What we did here is the orange part. So we added our own custom version of another um, line before the Kubernetes parts. We basically added our own custom resource definition, then the custom resources as resources inside the API server. The custom resource definition is also a resource, so it gets a little Basically, everything is a resource, but the definition is there, the custom resource is there, and the operator, which, by the way, also counts as a resource, is down here, but would also show up in here. So same thing, as soon as a custom resource gets created, the API server sends out the events, and what our operator does is listen to the events from our custom resource definition, and in our case, only did the deployment and the service. And you might now be saying, OK, cool, I can create deployments and services with a Helm chart. I don't need an operator. What is this? And then you'd be absolutely right. If you just want to use this for deploying, you do not need an operator. But um, what the operator framework does is give you an idea of how many levels and layers there are for capabilities for the operator. So it starts with the first one, what we've basically seen 
is installation. So you can install other resources or create other resources. The next thing that's happening is seamless upgrades. We've seen a little touch of that with the um, versioning of the Tomcat, but this is a little bit more than that, right? It's supposed to ensure that a user doesn't need to make sure the application stays up, but instead the operator does that for you. The operator makes sure that you have highly available um, versions, that you have access to both of them, that any kind of changes are continued over. After the upgrades, it basically is the full life grade, the full life cycle, right? It's not just upgrades, it's backups, it's storing any kind of data. Especially important because a lot of Kubernetes relies on um, stateless applications. So what operators can do for you is take care of all the storage parts that you don't want to take care of. The insights come afterwards. So as soon as you've managed everything and are taking care of things automatically, you get a lot of metrics, you get a lot of information. And those you can then use to go to full autopilot or as um, one of the operator books refers to it as a tiny software SRE inside your cluster, which I found super adorable. And that's what you get if you have like a full sized super advanced operator that basically does everything of the application for you from possibly auto improving and auto fixing small errors that you get from insights to taking care of the life cycle and the application itself. Oh, um, if anybody's curious, there's a lot more info on the capabilities and how they decide which operator falls into what in this link. And there's a few more links out there. Um, there's the CoreOS blog talking about introducing operators for the first time. It's a very interesting read. The Kubernetes documentation is great for anybody getting started with it. Um, honestly, it's probably better than most documentation out there. And they're also very um, happy about feedback and improvements. The book that I talked about is um, Kubernetes Operators, mostly focused on the Go version, but still an interesting read to learn about the different pieces. And as I also mentioned, you don't necessarily have to write your own operators. It's a good learning tool. It's interesting to see, and it might be necessary for some things. But don't forget to first check out if it's already out there, right? Because there are a lot of companies doing this, writing operators for existing applications and existing tools. So there's quite a lot already. So contributing might be better than writing your own version. And the frameworks that I talked about earlier are also linked here. That was it. I ran through the snow a little faster than originally <laughs> planned, but that was it. How are we looking at Thanks, questions? Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we have a question. So random guy asks, uh, what is a pod and a replica set? So <laughs> he, wants, he wants an introduction on those Kubernetes co uh, concepts. OK, so um, replica set is basically what a deployment actually manages. A replica set is a grouping of pods. So basically, you have a deployment to select a replica, replica set and a replica set to select the pods. And the pods are groupings of containers. So think of the replica set, the versioning of pods. Think of replica set as the versioning of pods and pods as a grouping of containers. Did that make the random person happy? I hope so. Uh, yeah. Let's see if he gives uh, some feedback on that. Uh, I also have uh, a question, which is, you mentioned that um, the operators with the operators, you could fix small bugs or sm sorry, small errors. So, can you give us some examples of small errors that this can uh, well overcome? So, if you think about um, things that might usually go wrong with applications, like having a pod kicked out of something with um, an out of memory reason, for example, right? So, your application might see that and the operator might realize, oh, I need to make sure to have proper limits or something. Or to, this is again, the, the, the smart side is on the operator side, right? This is the, the idealization of um, software being able to learn and actually improve. Um, or if you have um, 
um, an application that gets a lot of load. So if you watch the metrics on your pods and see you get a lot more incoming than you would normally want or normally have, and your pods are having trouble dealing with that, you can have your operator automatically scale up. Okay, you can customize the, the way uh, you scale. Uh, okay. It's just an example, right? Could also be that if you have a regular bug coming up on the application and you can't figure out how to fix it, instead of doing it inside the application, you do it with the operator. I'm not saying this is good practice or anything, but it could happen. So we have yet another question. So uh, Gunardi Sutanto is uh, asking us, what's the best practices for the stateful set? Best practices for stateful set? That's a fairly generic question. Um, you use it when you have some sort of statefulness in your application. Right. The idea is that the statefulness, so if you have an application that actually relies on, for example, specific um, uh, persistent volumes, and those need to be coming up in the same order, that's pretty much what a stateful set gives you. Right? It gives you the ordering of the pods, and it gives you the ordering of things that are attached to the pods. If you have an application that relies on that, it makes sense to use a stateful set. Best practices? beats me. I would say check out the Kubernetes documentation. I'm sure they have a great design doc somewhere. <laughs> okay. So, Charles, uh, I think we are done with the questions. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for being here at Genation. Uh, I hope we can have you again uh, in the future in person here in Quibra, Portugal. Uh, so, thanks very much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.